Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us today on behalf of uh, City College, Bureau of Campus of the University of York. Uh, I'm Nikos Zacharis, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, especially thank the distinguished guests that uh, have, uh, sorry, have uh, agreed to be with us today, and also everybody who is uh, watching this on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, I just want to say a few things before I pass the floor to the to the moderator. Uh, we have been informed that uh, Mr. Vlachogiannis will be a little bit late, so we will uh, we'll welcome him when he's, uh, when he's available. Uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, there's a chat uh, mechanism, so you can, you can chat, you can send questions. If you have any questions for the speakers or for us, the organizers, you can put it in the chat and I will convey these questions and try to answer as many as possible. Um, and also, I would like to ask uh, everybody who's participating, our, our speakers, to keep their microphones muted when they don't speak so we don't have uh, noise. Um, I don't want to say anything more, more. Thank you very much. And I will pass the floor uh, to our moderator, uh, Dr. Alexandra Podromidou, uh, who is uh, an assistant uh, professor at City College uh, and also the program lead of the Masters in International Relations in European Studies. Thank you, Nico. So, hello, everyone. I would like to uh, welcome you to this online uh, conversation that we're going to have on how to start your international relations career. Um, this discussion is uh, is being organized within uh, it's it's being organized by City College University of York Europe campus. Uh, within the framework of the uh, MA International Relations and European Union Studies. Um, which is part of the Department of Humanities. So um, I will start by um, introducing you to our uh, speakers today. Uh, we have with us Professor Asteris Kuliaras, who comes from the University of the Peloponnese, and he is going to uh, discuss the skills that are required in academia and research by uh, graduates of international relations in European Union studies, Professor Dimitris Keridis, who is um, uh, a professor at Pandium University and also a member of um, the Hellenic Parliament uh, with New Democracy, and he's going to discuss the skills that are required um, in politics. Um, Dr. Sotiris Petropoulos, uh, another academic from the University of the Peloponnese, uh, but also joining us today um, as the co-founder of uh, the NGO incubator Higgs, uh, which is one of the most, if not the most successful um, NGO in, um, in Greece. Uh, Mr. Michalis Panopoulos, the general counsel from the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank, who is going to um, shed some light on uh, what are the needs of international organizations. Uh, Ms. Maria Zakali, um, the UK consular and head of British Council, uh, who is going to discuss diplomatic missions uh, and diplomacy in general. Um, and uh, we will be joined later on by Mr. Manolis Vlachoyanis, the Vice President of the Thessaloniki Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Okay, so uh, I'll start um, with Professor Dimitris Kiridis, who needs, uh, who cannot stay with us very long. And the question that I would like to pose is, what are the main skills that are sought after in your sector, so politics, political career, uh, consultants to politicians and so on and so forth from graduates of international relations and European Union studies. Nice, ah, it's very nice. Thank you very much, Alexandra, and thank you for the invitation. You're doing a wonderful job at uh, City College. Uh, our government is very determined to follow the path of uh, uh, academic institutions such as yourself in uh, promoting extroversion and um, uh, the better connection of uh, Greek uh, public university with uh, market trends 
and international trends and other institutions beyond uh, Greece. We start from a low point and for many, many years we have uh, been left behind, uh, but now we are accelerating our pace and uh, we want to follow the example of uh, uh, small uh, but uh, very innovative uh, uh, establishments such as City in Thessaloniki and some others, a few others here in Athens as well, uh, in that uh, uh, path. And I think this panel this uh, afternoon uh, uh, takes place within this uh, uh, broader framework and I'm very happy to be part of. Now, international relations, that's a very quick uh, uh, comment, uh, is a social science, uh, it's a very ambitious social science. I think uh, uh, students, scholars, practitioners of international relations uh, have a certain ambition because it deals with the largest uh, social system around. It doesn't deal with uh, small things or peripheral things, uh, as important as they might be, the family or the ethnic group or the state, but with all the states put together in what is called the international system. So it pre presupposes uh, a certain uh, uh, bulimia, a certain uh, ambition on the part of uh, the person uh, uh, to know uh, the big things, uh, the things that matter the most. Uh, and there is nothing bigger in, uh, uh, as a social phenomena uh, than the international system, I would say. Uh, and so a certain uh, prerequisite, especially for the practitioners, maybe not so much as theoreticians, is this uh, ambition and obviously uh, to know languages, uh, to be able to understand others, um, to like history, and to combine both, uh, and you do that in the new masters that you are starting, both uh, the theoretical uh, understanding that bring, brings you, uh, gives you uh, the um, uh, general framework to be able to understand the details and the particular phenomena, and the practical knowledge of certain things, say Europe, Turkey, Mediterranean, China, and whatsoever. And I think this is, uh, this is what you are doing in your masters, as far as I understand the curriculum, and it's a very interesting and very useful combination, the theory with the practice and the practical knowledge. Now, when it comes to politics, obviously it is a, a one, now that I'm thinking out loud, one can uh, think of um, three levels the level of the elected official, the level of uh, consultant and advisor, and the level of the theoretician, the academic, the scientist of political science, let's say, who uh, uh, studies politics and teaches politics uh, uh, in a university, uh, let's say. Now, when it comes to the elected official, uh, uh, and I have transitioned myself from the latter to the former, uh, I would say that uh, uh, you obviously need the brain. Now, if I were to become anatomical uh, and speak about human anatomy, you need a brain, um, you need the knowledge um, uh, to understand what public policy is all about, obviously, uh, in its various aspects, both domestic and foreign. You need a heart in the sense that you need to empathize with people because politics is a business with people. A politics is a public function. Uh, it, you, you have to be able to go public, to be pa in public, to publish, to be published, to be able to engage with larger audiences and to carry the voters with you. And in that sense, you need emotional intelligence. But if I were to choose a human organ that is the most important, I would say it's neither the brain nor the heart, as important as they are, and I would choose the stomach. And I would say that you really need a stomach because politics, even in its most civilized form in our Western democracies, uh, is all about fight. 
Uh, there is a fundamental fighting element that one cannot ignore. Obviously, this fight takes place within certain limits, with certain rules, uh, etc., etc. But politics is about choices, it's about contrasts, it's about diverging opinions and arguing in favor or against them. And it's about to be able to take the hit. And as Harry Truman, who was totally underestimated before he became president, and he was considered um, a poor substitute for the greatest of American presidents, FDR, Roosevelt, used to say, if you cannot take the hit, get out of the kitchen. And I myself learn it if I were to be confessional and sincere, more sincere than, uh, uh, than usual, maybe a little improper, improperly sincere. I would say that I learned it the hard way. And it was a lesson during the campaign of 2019 that I treasure, I treasure the most. Politics is about fighting, Fighting with arguments, fighting with uh, ethos and uh, high morals, of course, uh, not uh, going down the mat. But if you are not willing to fight, then don't do it. If you are not willing to have enemies and you only want to have friends, you are not meant for politics. Thank you, because... Brian, Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. I as many, yeah, I as many friends as you make, you must realize that at the same time you make enemies, that enemies is impossible. And experienced politicians who have 30, 40, 50 years behind them understand that and they will tell you uh, that. Now, obviously, when you do political consultant and you are not exposed yourself into the heat of the bat battle, it's a completely different thing. There, uh, you can be protected. You don't need the stomach that much you can the stomach you need everywhere even in the simplest things obviously because we live in competitive society but you know what i mean and uh then when it comes to political science uh you can you can do away with the heart as well you can uh, stay with the brain pontificate from the safety of academia obviously it helps if you can connect with people you become a better teacher asteris who i know is a, a primary example of such a good teacher but even if you cannot connect and you are being disconnected as long as you can theorize and write and think uh great uh, 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 uh you might be okay so this is what i would say thank, thank you, you. Thank you Dimitri, very much uh so we're talking about uh, debates we're talking about being able to um, argue, ar argumentation building, um, and so on. Thank you very much for this. Um, let's go um, in alphabetical order to Professor Esteris Kouliaras. What, what would you say about academia and the skills that are expected? Well, <laughs> the big issue. First of all, I'm very glad to be with you. Uh, I think this event is an ideal beginning for a new program. Uh, it, it's ideal, I think, to start with a discussion on job opportunities. And I would like to congratulate uh, City College and Professor Prodromidou for the initiative. Well, if you study politics and or international relations, you don't... <laughs> You don't. You, you 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 may not want to become a politician. When uh, Dimitri was was talking, I remember uh, Epicurus, the famous philosopher, who thought that politics was a, a needless cause of stress and anxiety. Uh, I think that there is a wide a widespread misconception. There is this mis misconception that people that study international relations have limited job opportunities. Uh, I have taught at the university for more than 25 years. And uh, I think that, that this uh, misconception 
is totally untrue. The truth is that uh, international relations graduates have more and better career opportunities than most other social scientists. Of course, as Dimitri has said, there are several preconditions to, to realize uh, a career path. It is not enough to study international relations. It is extremely important to have an international outlook, to be willing to travel and work abroad, to be ready to move from country to country, to be able to communicate and cooperate with people from different cultures, uh, to be able to confront challenges with an open mind, without prejudices. I, I can tell you from my experience in a public university, and not only one public university, but several public universities, that unfortunately, most graduates of international relations departments of Greek public universities do not have an international outlook. They prefer, after graduating, to continue to work and live in the same city in which they were born and sometimes in the same neighborhood. I think that City College, as far as I know, is one of the exceptions. It has a long tradition of internationalization with students and graduates from several countries, including, uh, as far as I know, uh, several politicians and, and a few ministers, I think. And of course, uh, it has a long tradition of, of academic excellence. So what, what, what a young person is looking for when he or she studies international relations? What kind of, of job is able to do? In which organization? I, most of, of our graduates in the university think about a career in government. The majority want to become diplomats. Or relatively fewer want to work for an international organization. Their idea is the following. Let's have a degree and then apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the European Union, or the United Nations. This is the obvious choice, but this is a very difficult one. I mean, students tend to think that these are big organizations that offer thousands of positions. In reality, they are not. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs employs less people than including the foreign missions, than the hospital evangelismos next door. The European Union employs, let's say, around 60,000 people, much less than the Greek Ministry of Education. And the United Nations system, I mean, all these organizations, from the World Bank to the World Health Organization, I mean, tens of organizations in the United Nations system, employ let's say 120,000 people, something like that. Uh, so this is less than one fifth of the Greek civil servants. Of course, for young graduates, I think it is useful to have a look at the European Personnel Selection Office, EPSO, or to have a look at the UN Careers site about the profiles of staff. Uh, the European Union and or the United Nations are looking for. However, these are very competitive positions. They often require postgraduate degrees, extensive experience, and of course, job openings in both the European Union and the United Nations and in other organizations are limited by national quotas. So my advice is that most opportunities appear outside ministries of foreign affairs, uh, international organizations that most people think of. My advice is that there are thousands and thousands of positions outside 
this 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 group of organization uh, there are plenty of opportunities in a sector most public universities not only in Greece but also in other countries rarely focus and the generic term is international development I think that international development offers a very wide range of opportunities. You could be working in policy development, developing donor relations, delivering aid on the ground, supporting colleagues through uh, human resource initiatives, and so on. The list goes on. What underpins the work in international development is a desire to promote economic and human development in other countries. So, of course, a degree is a prerequisite, but it is often not enough. Many uh, uh, of those people that work in international development have postgraduate degrees, gained relevant experience through volunteering or internships. If you are in international development, as you progress in your career, it's common to become more specialist and expert in a particular field. Then many people from international development move at the second stage to international organizations like the European Union and the United Nations. So what I'm thinking of, what kind of organizations? First of all, development consultancies. This bid for work from government donor agencies such the United States Agency for International Development, the Department for International Development in the United, you know, in the United Kingdom, uh, Danida in Denmark. Uh, 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 these are a mix of specialist consultancies, uh, but also large management consultancies, such as Ernst Young, uh, PwC, Deloitte, Deloitte, and KPMG. Then another organization that most people do not think of are foundations. These are large organizations like uh, the Bill Gates Foundation or the Volkswagen Foundation, philanthropic foundations which donate bursaries, fund projects, and in some cases deliver support on the ground. Then, uh, of course, uh, think tanks that are small organizations involved in uh, research and policy work, there are hundreds of them in Europe. Uh, and finally, of course, this is a new, a new, a new, uh, a relatively new sector is social enterprises. Typically, small organizations run on private sector models, but designed with a special purpose in mind. So the international development sector is competitive and beginning your career can be a challenge. The key is to start getting practical experience. Sotiris uh, Petropoulos specializes on, uh, who is the next speaker, on non-governmental organizations, uh, international NGOs among them, a large subsector. Uh, that have uh, the large ones, many thousands of staff. Think about CARE, World Vision, International Rescue Committee, Save the Children, Action Aid, to small locally based organizations with a handful of employees. And there is great flexibility in the nonprofit sector and then comparatively causal professional environment. I don't want to say more about this. Sotiris is the expert, and I think that. Uh, he has many good advices to give. Thank you. Thank, so you, very much. Here. Thank you very much. That was very enlightening. Um, and um, uh, what you mentioned about practicum, I mean, this is definitely a staple that we took into consideration as well in our um, in the development of um, our master's degree. So um, I, I wish I had the chance when I was a graduate to have this kind of uh, information by all of you. So uh, let's let's move to Sotiris uh, Petropoulos um, on the NGO uh, sector, a sector which is um, 
it is uh, fast developing in Greece and many, many graduates uh, have found uh, work there. Yes, um, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation to speak on a, a very important issue that I think that it is on the mind of um, uh, almost every um, undergraduate, postgraduate student um, all over the world. How can we actually, uh, how can our uh, education uh, lead us to some tangible results in the working environment and the workplace? So um, I, I'm here talking and representing Higgs, which is a Greek nonprofit that um, uh, runs an incubator and accelerator for both uh, nonprofit organizations as well as uh, social enterprises. Um, and um, uh, most of what I'm going to uh, briefly say uh, come from this experience, as well as a lot of uh, research documents and reports that show uh, that um, uh, in general and overall, we see uh, a very dynamic trend within what we would call the third sector uh, in terms of um, a, both uh, the number of organizations and social enterprises that are being created. And this is not just in Greece, it is all over Europe and uh, in, uh, in, in many, many countries around the world, uh, but also in terms of uh, job creation, which means that uh, specific gaps and needs are being created uh, to which uh, uh, a graduate from um, international relations, European studies degrees uh, could be um, a, a very good match. So um, what we are seeing um, uh, in today's world is, is are two main trends. The first one is that people are becoming more interested into um, a, taking part in something that creates a positive social impact. And this usually can be uh, reinforced by being employed, by supporting either as a volunteer or, or as an employee, or by setting up your own nonprofit organization or social enterprise. Um, just imagine on trends such as B Corps, social enterprises, uh, in general nonprofits, impact investment, uh, social bonds, Everything we see in our world that we talk a lot about that, and even we, we are talking about the core of capitalism, right? So even there we see an approach uh, towards more social dimensions of entrepreneurship. So uh, indeed we have a lot of um, initiatives uh, that uh, require uh, more people to join in order to A, uh, create a good base and B, accelerate. And we see that in all of, of our programs. Um, so this is one trend. So a lot of new uh, organizations are being created, and this means that there is a uh, a big um, 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 opportunity there. The second one is that uh, gradually all this ecosystem is becoming. It requires to become a, a more uh, um, skills oriented. Uh, in the past, you will see a lot of people that they wouldn't know about, uh, you know, uh, fundraising or communications, etc. And they would do a good job, but not a very good job. Now, everything is is becoming more competitive. And this means that um, uh, we need to have a more technocratic approach and insights that can be brought about by people that they have studied specific parts of, um, uh, of, of what is needed to run a nonprofit, for example. And uh, people that um, uh, they are um, doing a degree uh, in EU studies, international relations, uh, they definitely have uh, a very good, a very strong base in order to enter this ecosystem. Uh, one of the uh, biggest needs that we see are people that they could support the fundraising uh, department of any given organization. And there, as one part of the funding usually comes from EU related sources uh, and channels uh, uh, of funding. Uh, definitely uh, understanding how the European Union works, understanding how several opportunities are being created, even just knowing the words programmatic period or, uh, um, uh, or um, 
uh, uh, EU uh, tenders is something that will, uh, is very, very important. And I, this definitely is connected also with what Professor Huyaras mentioned about the international development dimension. But um, this is also important for in the national context. So Greek nonprofits, uh, nonprofits around the Balkans or Southeast Europe, where we see a lot, a lot of new organizations being created and being quite dynamic. They really need people that they have an understanding of how the EU works and how in general uh, political context, social dimension of um, a lot of political decisions are um, affecting the operational environment in which nonprofits and social enterprises are, are working. Um, I expect also that people that are interested in EU studies, for example, they are quite keen into learning one, two uh, additional uh, languages. So if you have that, it's not a prerequisite, but it is uh, a plus because a lot of the times we are talking about uh, a lots of energy being devoted to networking and creating links with uh, similar organization or getting trips to Brussels in order to run an advocacy campaign or communicating with different people. And always when you are, you have an ability to talk on their own language, you are getting more points uh, in a way. Um, communications. This is another dimension that we have seen that people that they are around social studies, international relations, European studies, they are more comfortable into expanding um, their um, uh, practical uh, activities into, into that sector and being quite good there. Uh, because, again, communications is about understanding a bit and being able to analyze the, the overall context in which you, you operate. And usually these are things that you get from uh, such studies. Um, and again, because uh, it is a more competitive uh, environment, because we see uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, organizations trying to get the attention of uh, the any given society or funders or any uh, potential promoter, uh, they need to have a strong base into running social media, being able to write a press conference, to to run a, to organize a press conference, uh, create a conference, and um, uh, actually run it. Also, uh, this is also very important. But one thing that we see, and I'm gonna stop there to to allow for more uh, discussion, maybe later, and some questions, maybe, is, is the following. What is being missed, especially in the um, in Southeast Europe, East Europe, Greece, a bit of the of the EU South, is one dimension of um, uh, the nonprofit third sector ecosystem that we see in more advanced ecosystems, which is the advocacy slash watchdog mechanism that it is present a lot of the times in many uh, developed uh, um, ecosystems, like for example in. Uh, France or Germany or the UK and um, at, so, uh, at some degree the, uh, the US. So this again is something that there is a clear need. It's a bit more difficult uh, to, uh, to create and to uh, be able to afford to have it uh, as a non-profit. So uh, it takes a bit of time and most of these ecosystems that I'm talking about around that geographic area of Europe um, uh, they are a bit in baby steps or, you know, not very, very advanced yet, but it is a certainty that they're going to be in a level, and we see it also in Greece, that there will be required by them to run more watchdog activities, meaning that they check on how politicians, the state is running, how companies are running, etc., uh, as well as running advocacy activities and campaigns, meaning that we want to change how uh, the whole structure of any given state operates uh, towards uh, meeting societal needs. So there again, people that they would be comfortable into writing um, um, uh, uh, specific um, uh, uh, papers on an issue, uh, policy statements, etc., are people that they will be required in the sector. So uh, this, again, I think that it is a major trend and um, it, it, I'm very, very optimistic on, on how many jobs can be and are being created. And just keep in mind that usually, and this is a very important thing, uh, is that um, the nonprofits 
for example, and to a certain degree, social enterprises, they are anti-cyclical, meaning that usually when you have an economic downturn, more money are being infused to the sector because more needs are there. And then on the other hand, when the economy goes great, then we have this immense, very uh, powerful trend of being post-materialistic and of rich people wanting to support social um, uh, uh, social activities, uh, activities with positive social impact, that again, we see a reinforcement of uh, funding towards the sector uh, because then they have the money to give. So, um, yeah, there, I'm not really worried about employment positions being created in non-profit sector in general. Thank you. Thank you, Sotiri. That was great and a very positive message as well. So, uh, highlighting here, obviously, I mean, you know, we have seen in the past uh, 10 years, at least, uh, lots of graduates from international relations and European Union studies going into the third sector, um, especially after the, uh, the migrant uh, crisis and so on. And this trend will continue on. Uh, skills that have been highlighted here, again, networking, communication, yeah, ability to be able to communicate in writing and oral speech, um, and, and of course, understanding of, um, of the environment, the EU environment and the international environment. Um, so now we will move to Mr. Michalis Panopoulos from the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank to talk a little bit about international organizations. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I was riveted by uh, listening to uh, the distinguished speakers before me. Um, and it made me realize that there are certain very, very obvious common points here. Um, the first thing that impressed me, that, that absolutely apply to that sort of international organization I happen to be the general counsel of, and I'll tie to that shortly. But the first thing is, I, I definitely agree with Professor Keridis that there really has to be some orient, some inner orientation toward the largest possible picture. There must be something in you that that craves before you even know who you are and what you want to do that you know passes by an airport by the way apologies i'm in an airport lounge unfortunately because i had to travel um uh, without the short notice so there must be something in you that gets really excited that craves to sort of peek over national boundaries you know what, what cultural boundaries and figure out what you know what is it like what's the whole world like what was the whole world like before that kind of thing um, um i certainly remember that i i was a, a you know middle class boy growing up in athens uh, you know more than half a century ago and it wasn't enough for me i i i, I needed to know what is the world like you know why are we here why why was i born here and somebody else born there that's one so there, there needs to be uh dimitri called it ambition I call it a craving for understanding of the largest possible picture and a fascination with it. All right. Second, you really, at the end of the day, um, have to have a willingness uh, to, to abandon your safe harbors, whatever they are. Take risks when you're young, including volunteering, heading into conflict jurisdictions, uh, you know, joining NGOs with with peanuts or not a lot of money in the beginning, you have to have a willingness to take risks and offer yourself to people in organizations that may need you in peculiar and difficult jurisdictions, but at the same time derive from that the practical experience and the entrance into this world that Sotiris was talking about before. Uh, now, I think that the Americans said it right in the word, in, in the sense that that you know they have a college system and they 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 afterwards have you know you you choose a particular direction you become a little bit more practical about this or that or the other. 
I think that at the end of the day, when you're young and you choose to study international relations, um, uh, you can you can you can then absolutely supplement that inevitably. Yeah, you you have to supplement that with with history. You have to supplement that with a fundamental economic understanding. You have to have an understanding of economics. Uh, you have to have an understanding of how power conflict actually relates, and sometimes it it is caused by um, uh, economic uh, what we call economic um, uh, causes. Okay, how do you, how do you, how do I what do I look for? In a multilateral development bank, Black Sea Trade and Development Bank is an institution that that um, uh, in in many ways demonstrates what humanity has very nobly tried to do after the um, Second World War. Catastrophic experiences were very vivid in everybody's mind. First of all, they understood that Homo sapiens has global problems. How simple is that? We know, I mean, it's the truth. The dialectic of conflict that went on for a very long time in history ended up in a system where you affect the planet, we all know it. You have nuclear weapons, you all know it. Uh, given the, in many ways, positive developments of globalization, you have a problem here and it hits on the other side of the planet in ways that are almost chaotic and unpredictable, and so on and so forth. So. Um, MDBs were created to be entities, multilateral development banks, that is, to be entity, entities that, one, are, to the extent possible for, for the folly of humanity, apolitical, that take a much larger, broader view of development um, over decades uh, uh, because it, they understand the importance of cross-border development. Then they absolutely um, try to to overcome problems of um, nepotism, of captured development banks in in individual states, and so on and so forth. So the idea is you you take the credit, you take the credit ratings of some of your large countries. You're able to borrow money cheaply, uh, and at the same time you gather inside your roof you gather the best possible technocratic um, talent that you can get um, i said that it manifests uh, my institution for example manifests the noble cause of international economic relations in a developmental effort because under our own roof we have um, you know, half our member states were one at one point or another over the undulations of history, they are in conflict with each other, right? We have, we shelter the three largest monotheistic religions in the same, under the same roof. Um, culturally speaking, I mean, people that grew up in the, in the Soviet era are mingling with people that are, you know, uh, coming from the abundance of capitalism in, in the United States and so on and so forth. All right. So this this whole thing, this whole thing is a wonderful cauldron of that requires qualities that both um, uh, uh, Sotiris, I believe, mentioned, and Dimitris mentioned, and Asteris mentioned. It requires qualities of an openness, of a certain nobility of purpose inside you uh, to want to offer, not necessar necessarily by being an active politicians, uh, politician in the Epicurean way that um, Asteris mentioned. But also not being an idiot, because the ancient, the etymology of the <laughs> the etymology of the word idiot in English comes from the Greek word idiotis, and and that meant somebody who who only deals with his own personal affairs, and doesn't somehow participate in public affairs. Therefore, that person is fairly foolish, because at the end of the day, we are all in the same ship, one whether we like it or not. What do I look for? Um, as a bank, and, and I know very well because I'm now, <laughs> I'm 14 years the general counsel of B3B, which means, which means that I'm now the third longest serving general counsel of multilateral development banks and other financial institutions like, like the IMF or the World Bank and so on um, in the world. And I can tell you that we all look for the same thing. We look, we look for people 
that have a certain degree of de uh, hunger for, as, as, as uh, Dimitri said, hunger to understand the broadest possible picture, a certain nobility of purpose that they have a certain, a certain almost, almost, uh, almost naive idealism that humanity is not condemned to maintain its uh, uh, Heraclitian folly that war is the father of anything, and we can actually do better than that. So there is an element of that. Huh? There is an element of having gone and worked for NGOs, of having gone and explored academia, perhaps even having gone into local politics or what have you, or participated in communities. Huh? And that people somehow, over this period of time, they, they gather in themselves a sense of, you know what? In a multilateral development bank, I can actually accomplish a lot of things, believe it or not. I love being surrounded by other cultures. I love breaking the boundaries of my stereotypes and my upbringing and broad, broadening my heart to my brothers and my sisters around the world. That's a wonderful thing. And by the way, yeah, I do understand what conflict is. I do understand history. I do understand economics. And here I am. And here I am. So I look for people that took risks. I look for people that had that gut inclination toward this. Um, I look for people that have that that actually have a little bit of a dream, huh? a little bit of this this, this optimistic thing that that um, uh, Stephen Pinker put in that Enlightenment book. That that, that is a fantastic book and, and reminds us what we have accomplished in the last three centuries. To cut a long story short, by the way, I am always available to in our own offices in Thessaloniki. We have we have a beautiful. A beautiful building in front of the water. My office is big enough to accommodate anyone that is interested in actually learning a bit more about these institutions. They're very peculiar. They're very precious. They're still very young institution, believe, institutions, believe it or not. And I'll stop here because I don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. So that was very inspirational. I guess uh, graduates of uh, international relations and uh, EU studies are. Um, a, a, a peculiar species of uh, um, curious beasts about power, power structures, social relations, and the world around us. So thank you very much about that. Um, I will move now to uh, Ms. Maria Tsakali uh, from the uh, British Council to talk to us a little bit about diplomatic missions. Uh, hello, hello from me. Hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm really, really excited to be a member of this panel and to be meeting such interesting and exciting speakers, co-speakers. Some of them are meeting for the first time, but it's 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 a great pleasure. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, as it's written down on the program, uh, you wrote me down as UK councillor. I am the uh, UK honorary consul here in Thessaloniki, but I'm not a formal diplomat or I'm not a diplomat in the strict sense of the word. Uh, I'm the head of the British Council office in Thessaloniki. I work very closely with the embassy and I represent the embassy on certain occasions. I assist the embassy in on the ground for the work that we deliver here. So I'll try to give my overview, uh, taking into account both, you know, the skills and 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 um, um, the skills that the British Council requires for new people, as well as uh, the experience that I have gained from working closely with the embassy and the role that staff have there. So first of all, let me just say what the British Council does, because I think it is important for students who watch us now to actually see how relevant the degree that they will be getting or they have received might be to cultural organizations and especially international organizations such as the British Council. So what we do, we are the International Organization for Cultural Relations and Educational Opportunities. Our mission is to create connections, understanding and trust between people in the UK and people all over the world. And we do that through activities in areas like arts, culture, education and the English language. And we work in two ways. We work with individuals uh, in order to equip them, to give them skills, to give them knowledge, to give them access to opportunities, to help them transform their lives. And of course, we work with governments and we work with partners to make a bigger difference for the longer term. 
So as you understand, as an organization that operates in more than 100 countries, it gives that unique opportunity to degree holders, to holders of international relations and European studies degrees. It gives them a unique opportunity to put the knowledge they will obtain in that program into very good practice. Because we work with cultures, across cultures, we work not on an isolated basis, on a country basis, but we work with other countries. We create bilateral programs, we create multilateral programs. We try to develop partnerships uh, and don't look only at Europe, but look at the whole world. So as a global organization, there are regions where conflict needs to be managed and different different human rights agendas are you know in the priority of the british council or elsewhere so what i want to say i'm not a graduate of an international relations degree i have studied english language and literature so to be able to participate on this panel i just had to go through and look into into the details of an international relations program to dive into the requirements and i have to say that it's very relevant and it's very applicable to organizations like the British Council. And I would imagine that the work that we do echoes a lot the work that other cultural institutes do all over the world. So uh, what are the skills that we're looking for? Of course, there are different strands of activities within the British Council, but I think that where a degree in international relations would be most relevant is the area of cultural engagement. And it's the area of cultural engagement because it's there that we try to develop educational programs, where we try to build multilateral programs, and where a, a graduate of an international relations degree would have that cultural knowledge, that specialization in under, an understanding in the cultural approaches that would be so beneficial for the development of such a program. So that, that specialization, that greater awareness of different cultures, that appetite and curiosity that speakers before me mentioned is extremely important for, you know, taking part in a program, uh, putting your creativity in a program, taking a program, a collaboration, a step further. And of course, this needs to be coupled with other with other skills, so communication skills and interpersonal skills, being able to put your knowledge of, of culture, of a certain subject, put it into good, good effect by being able to manage relationships. And the confidence that you have when you bring that knowledge, that cultural knowledge and understanding on the table is absolutely uh, fundamental for the work that we do in the British Council. And I'm looking and I'm you know, asking graduates, students who, who are listening to us right now to look into opportunities at the British Council globally, because uh, it, it is very much based on mobile staff, on staff that needs to have that international experience and needs to have that enthusiasm to work internationally. It provides opportunities for mobile positions. And if you go into the uh, central British Council webpage, there's also a talent community, as they call it. So there may not be vacancies available, but you are able there to register your interest and that kind of interest will be picked up later at a convenient time for a job opportunity that might that might appear. Uh, on the diplomat side, the diplomatic missions, I don't want to leave that aside. As I said, I'm not uh, I'm not a diplomat in the formal sense of the word, but being an honorary consul for more than 10 years now and working so closely with the embassy, I can actually see how a degree in international relations is absolutely fundamental for the work that uh, uh, colleagues do there. Uh, because, as you know, embassies have a wide range of sectors in which they work, from foreign policy, uh, politics, to migration, to, to business sectors, to education, to whatever you want to name it, whatever it is that a country, a foreign country, uh, is working on in order to build relationships, fruitful relationships, strategic relationships with a country in which it is hosted. So in that respect, having that cultural knowledge and understanding, having, you know, a depth knowledge of social sciences. Um, all of that is extremely important for the work that they do uh, in analyzing information, in interpreting information, in understanding the developments around them, in being able to be creative and, and, and knowledgeable uh, in the areas in which they work. I'll, I think I'll stop there because I think that the question was around the skills that graduates will gain when they take a degree and how relevant and how applicable these the skills are in in this particular sector. So I hope that has been useful to those listening to us. Thank you very much, Rania. That was very, very useful. And also thank you for touching up, uh, upon both 
um, diplomatic missions, but also uh, non formally diplomatic career that uh, somebody can uh, can follow. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have with us Mr. Manolis Lajoyanis, the Vice President of the Thessaloniki Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we would like to hear from you as well. What kind of skills would you look into a graduate of international relations and European studies in uh, the area of your expertise? Thank you very much for your uh, for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, I have been asked to present some uh, ideas how um, graduates can uh, benefit from uh, from um, learning some additional skills in order to be uh, active in uh, international relations. First of all, international relations are essential for any. Um, company for any any business that is intending uh, to be present in different markets all over the world and uh, that is um, uh, uh, that's this requiring an additional skills that means uh, people need to understand uh, uh, the different uh, parts uh, different parts of the world the culture of, of the persons uh, with them are deemed to work and uh, I separate uh, the skills in, so, let's say, technical skills. Foreign languages, of course, is uh, one technical skill that is important uh, to to, uh, to learn. Second, uh, it is very important to learn a little bit of the history of the country, because if you go out uh, in another country to to make any business or to make any uh, kind of contact. You have to learn a little bit of uh, uh, the history of the country. You have to be aware of the situation of the people that you contact. Then third, what is important is a, a mental uh, skill. A mental skill means adaptability to, to different cultures. And that is something that has to be uh, methodically uh, um, cultivated. Of course, uh, no one is uh, uh, obliged to adapt to any uh, uh, to any any uh, specific uh, uh, item of uh, the, the foreign uh, culture. It is not very easy. I can tell you one uh, example. Years ago, I seven to eight years ago, I have been in Tokyo. I was uh, present at, at the dinner that was uh, presented by the Tokyo Chamber of Commerce, and uh, one of the dishes uh, included a soup where a raw fish was swimming in. That is something that is very hard to digest, and it's hard in something that if you see it, you you are, you, you are in a shock. You don't have to to to, to try to to eat that dish, but you don't have also to show that you are shocked. It is a balance. It is a, it is a delicate balance you have to follow. Uh, you can say with your expressions that I am not part of this culture, but I respect the culture of the different people. If you try to imitate the culture, you will be uh, sooner or later ridiculous. And that is not um, appreciated by your foreign counterpart. So, um, what is uh, again very important in in, uh, 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 in skills is uh, to adapt to learn how to adapt, how to adapt, how to reasonably adapt to to, to different cultures around the world. And if you do that, you have uh, exercised. Uh, something that is uh, very important for your career and i think uh, the basis of that is um, to be uh, learned in an institution like your institution and so uh, teachers uh, in your institution have to be uh, have to give students uh, the the sense that they have to respect uh, different cultures they have to to learn about the uh, history of uh, the countries and, uh, of course, to uh, not show uh, to them uh, parts of uh, their own culture that are contraprodu contraproductive to 
any any kind of uh, engagement of contact. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much. Again, I have to go back to my chamber because, as you know, I have uh, a webinar running at this uh, uh, time, and uh, I thank you very much for your invita for the invitation to participate in this one. So everything uh, well to do you and uh, for the participants. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rafoyanis. Um, and um, at, at this point, I think we can conclude. Um, so again, a big thank you. It has been extremely informative, like you shared with uh, potential candidates, and and you know, obviously, with us, a wealth of information about the diversity of international relations and you start these degrees, what can people do? But not not only what they can do. I mean, you know, I, I think that was that was the most important thing is is how we can we can actually transform ourselves through this kind of studies. And uh, personally, I mean, I, I even went back to my own early student years and you know how I used to be and how you know I developed through this kind of studies, understanding other human societies, power, politics, economics. All these kind of things. Okay, so um, thank you again very, very much. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you for, for the participation. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.